Hey guys, what is going on? I'm Alexander Williamson and you are watching Fish Tree. Now, today I have something that is going to change the course of how we see evolution. Not just fish evolution, but all evolution. And it changes our idea of evolutions and the time it takes. So if you remember Charles Darwin and the study he did on the Galapagos Island of the finches, those finches had specialized. They had special beaks. Some were for cracking nuts. Some were for getting into logs and little holes in trees. Others were for eating insects out of the air. And some were for eating fruits and seeds within the fruits and things like that. They all had special beaks and different shapes. Well, that took millions of years to evolve. So, we thought, okay, that takes some time, right? You know, it takes some time to specialize. And in some cases, like the crocodile and alligator, they've been essentially the same for 250 million years. In the case of crocodiles, 150 for alligators. It's insane. The same body type. So, how fast can evolution happen? And the latest research in the Journal of Science is about Lake Victorian cichlids and how incredibly fast they evolved. Now, this is something that blew all the other hypotheses out of the water, this paper. And it was a massive undertaking, pr predominantly led by the University of Bern in Switzerland. And uh, the University of Bern, not like flames, but like uh, the city, B-E-R-N. And in Switzerland, they took the genomes of 446 cichlids from Lake Victoria. Now, Lake Victoria is not itself a Rift Lake. A lot of people group it with the Rift Lakes and the Rift Lake cichlids, but it is not. The Rift Lakes are much older. Lake Victoria is only 16,000 years old, at least Fifteen to 16,000 years ago is when it filled with water last, and then it stayed filled with water. In the time before that, it emptied of water, it had salt water, it was an inland sea, it had fresh water, it had no water, it had a river. All these different things geologically happened because of the rise of sea level, because of glaciation, and because of different weather patterns that were going on. So, how did a lake uh, able to have over 500 species of cichlids. Some of them have gone extinct, unfortunately, and many more are facing extinction as we speak. So it's really crucial to understand where did these fish come from? And in our heads, a lot of people thought, you know, it took millions of years for these fish to evolve and to populate this lake. You know, there are fish everywhere in the lake from the deepest spots to the shallowest spots. There are fish that are an inch long full grown and there are fish that are almost three feet long full grown in the cichlid family. And it turns out we now know that all of them come from only three ancestors. Yes, that's three ancestors or if you're in Europe, three ancestors that are in the background of all the Victorian fish. So, how is that possible? And if the lake is only 15,000 to 16,000 years old, did they evolve in neighboring lakes and rivers? Did they evolve in Lake Malawi, where there's a thousand species? Did they hide in one of those deeper lakes and then maybe work their way back down? Uh, did they have little tiny lakes that they went to and speciated in? There are all these ideas that were out there, but now we have the genome of all those species, which is a massive undertaking of the University of Bern and that all these people work together. They sequenced the genomes of all the Victorian fish, you know, the ones that lived in the 1800s with the monocles and the top hats and the hoop skirt. No, not those Victorian fish. Uh, but yes, all the Victorian fish. And before we can talk about what this study discovered that is going to change evolution forever, 
I mean, the fact that two or three million years of evolution changed the beaks and some body shapes of finches on the Galapagos, yet we have fish that are this big to this big and all different colors, all different patterns, different eating strategies. Some eat scales, some eat algae, some only eat insects, some eat only other fish, some are omnivores, some are only bottom feeders, some are mouth brooders. It's, I mean, it is insane the different strategies that have come about in the fish world of that system of the Rift Lakes and Victoria. So in the cichlid group specifically, almost all those things I just listed have also evolved in the last 16,000 years. And now we can prove it. So first, we're going to have to go back. We're going to have to backtrack just a little bit. It's going to be interesting as well. But before I can tell you all the juicy details and the way that they survive, the way that these species haven't gone extinct by specializing, because many times species will go uh, very, very specifically uh, with an evolutionary trait, like they only eat one plant, for instance. And if that plant disappears, they all die. So how did these fish manage to survive yet still spread out? And that riddle has, for now anyways, the hypothesis has been thrown out there and it has been solved. So I will tell you that after we talk about a couple things that are going to come back around and make this whole puzzle fit together nicely. So let's talk about some North American fish first. We're going to talk about the stickleback, the three-spine stickleback, and we're going to talk about the trout that live in Wyoming. So let's talk about how these fish have allowed us to do the first steps in the science that needed to be done in order to do this work that we're doing now. Well, I'm not doing it, but that they're doing in Switzerland and in universities across Africa and across Europe and the U.S. that they're doing the, the groundwork, the basic principles, the, the fundamentals where did it come from and what are they? And then how does it apply to this situation? So let's jump in. Let's talk about those first two items as quickly as possible. And then I will tell you what is going to change science forever about this new research in the Journal of Science. All right, so looping back to North America, first we need to talk about the stickleback, the three-spine stickleback specifically. Now, these are an incredible fish that I think everybody should check out, should read about, should watch videos on and learn about in their own right. They are really cool. But the three-spine stickleback is an incredible fish because it has evolved to live in both freshwater and saltwater and brackish water. They can live in a low pH, in a high pH, in a neutral pH, high TDS, low TDS. They can be at freezing temperatures or they can be all the way up to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, something like 37 degrees Celsius. So they are a very, very, very adaptable fish as is when they're out in the wild. But because of scientists paying attention to these little fish, and specifically in my own hometown of Seattle, Washington, the University of Washington started paying attention to these fish in the very, very polluted lake of Lake Washington in the 1940s and 50s. By 1950 through 1952, the first study was done on these fish. Now, what you need to know about these fish is they're very small, they're very, uh, they're very social, they stay in groups, and the males and females have spines. They have three spines in the three-spine variety. And usually the first two are pretty good size and the other ones set back a little farther, a little smaller. Now these spines can be anywhere from a millimeter to 15 millimeters. So a, a centimeter and a half, half an inch long when they're a long spine on a little two and a half inch fish. Or they can be a millimeter or two and barely detectable and folded flat. So the angle of the spine and the length of the spine changes. And scientists noticed this early on. They noticed this in Lake Washington when the water was murky and muddy. Lake Washington used to be so polluted you could only see two feet in the best of conditions 
into the water. There was creosote, there were three different sewage plants, there was all sorts of trash and industrial stuff dumped into the lake, and it was nasty. All the fish that had lived there, all 30-some species that had been there at the turn of the century, almost all of them were gone, or any number of them were gone, by 1940, 1950. And so these sticklebacks were still around. They were living near the shore, and they were doing really well. But only two or three miles away, scientists could see sticklebacks out in the Puget Sound in the saltwater habitat. They could see them in other lakes, like Green Lake and, uh, you know, Holler Lake, other lakes that are in the Seattle area, and in rivers. And they knew that something was weird about the fish in Lake Washington. They knew that they had hardly any spikes hardly any armor. So the other thing about these fish is they have plates of armor. They can have anywhere from zero to, I believe it's 28 plates of armor. Very similar to a Corydoras or a Pleco. They have this very hard armor, like a fingernail on them almost. And that helps protect them. So when birds come down, swoop them and try to eat them, they get a mouthful of hard crunchiness and they spit them out because they also get spiked in the top of the mouth too. However, these fish in the muddy water didn't have these signs. So by happenstance, the same time the lake was being cleaned up. The lake was being cleaned up and scientists wanted to know what effect this would have on the stickleback population. There were still eagles and birds and things swooping down and eating the sticklebacks every now and their great blue herons and, and things like that were very common still. The eagles started dying in the 50s and 60s because of DDT and the shells getting smaller. So that wasn't even a predatory threat. Neither were the salmon runs and things that used to be really strong in the lake. So the, the sticklebacks didn't need the protection that they had 50 years ago. And that's known because people drew pictures when they discussed what fish were in the lake in the 1880s, 1890s, and 1900s. And the sticklebacks are always drawn with larger spikes and the armor that's totally gone. There's also markings, but we can't get into it. We don't have time. When they live in the grass, they have tiger stripes. When they live out in the open, they have silver on their belly and dark colors on their back. Uh, it's really amazing how they adapt to their micro uh, habitat. But back to the lake. So the lake gets cleaned up, and by the 70s, the spikes are twice, three times, four times as long on some of the fish as they were in the 50s. And it's because the water clarity had been expanded up to 10 feet. By the 80s and 90s, that was up to like 20 feet. Now it's almost at 30 feet on a sunny day, clear sunny day, blue skies. You can see down into the water very far. And the sticklebacks that live in the lake, not in the swampy sections, have spines that are a full 12 to 15 centimeters long. And they have all their armor, which means they were being predated from the sky and from the water again. Salmon runs return. And you could literally plot this on a graph in a line linearly, how the spines grew, how the patterns changed, and how these little fish evolved. So it was clear that these fish were changing at a phenomenal rate. In 50 years, from 1900 to 1950, when the lake was really polluted, they realized that they lost those traits. So how did they evolve so quickly? Was it like a birth defect or something? And this is what changed <clears throat> our look at evolution. This is one of the things that made old Darwin spin in his grave a, a million times over. Uh, you could power a small city by it. That is a new field altogether that is very important in these cichlids and why there's so many kinds, why they look so different, and how they evolve so quickly in Lake Victoria. But it's found in the sticklebacks, and it was first documented and hypothesized in sticklebacks and a number of other fish as well, uh, and also other creatures. But sticklebacks were the key. And it was that there is something other than just the genetics. There's something called epigenetics or a scaffold of DNA switches that turn on or off certain genes and or DNA orders. So the DNA may say, you're going to grow a spine and that may be off. 
Now, their great ancestors may have had 30 spines. So there may be, you know, 27 genes that are all turned off all the time. However, under the right conditions, these genes or epigenetic codes can be flipped on, just like puberty in humans. There's a code, there's a time, uh, it can be uh, due to time, it can be due to environmental factors, and we don't quite understand all of it yet, but something snaps and all of a sudden they realize whether it's the fish and the visibility in the water or whether it's something hormonal, whatever it may be, like hormonal from stress from predation, uh, it is linked directly to those genes being turned on or off. And the genes of having armor and having spikes were turned on as the water got clear. And so it was very clear that within, from 1952 to 1992, these fish changed and it was documented with photos every single year by the University of Washington. It wasn't just a hypothesis based on an old book, 50 years old, that was a sketchbook of a naturalist, and then looking now and thinking what happened. So this started to change the way we think about genetics, and this plays a major role in this whole fission and fusion that goes on in the lake of Lake Victoria and possibly many other places around the world. And this is one of the other groundbreaking things now. So we knew about the epigenetics, but now we're realizing that there may be codes. So for in a chicken, there's codes for scales. There's codes for a tail like a velociraptor. There's codes for teeth. And they've learned they can flip these on or off with certain chemical signals. And when a creature is very young, a lot of times these are turned on. And that's a, a pedomorphic or an embryonic stage of showing previous evolution. So that means all the cichlids that live in Lake Victoria, they could have had ancestors that were only algae eaters. And maybe it took 40 million years in some lake for them to be able to become only algae eaters, but they acquired that gene. And just because they acquired it, at some point, they may have had to go back to being uh, generalists, and that gene may have been turned off. Well, then, when they're put back into a lake and the only niche open is eating algae, they're the lucky ones that happen to be a population or a subpopulation within the group that maintain those ancient genes, and they flip them back on, and literally within a generation or two, they start evolving that ability to scrape off of the rocks with special teeth. Now, in cichlids, it's really, really amazing because they have something that is completely unique, which is they have a normal mouth, like a fish, and then they have a pharyngeal mouth or jaw. And they've got their main jaw, which keeps them generalists. All cichlids are able to kind of have the typical fish lips and fish mouth, and then what's inside is different. It may be teeth, it may be flat teeth like human teeth, it may be a bunch of broken jagged teeth like mine. <laughs> so, sorry about that, I'm still getting them marked on. And it may be something like they don't have teeth at all, they just use suction, you know, like a big bass, the way a bass kind of pulls food in uh, by making negative pressure. But either way, they've evolved this double set of jaws and no matter what they maintain that general set so even if they are evolved and they're very specialized if that niche changes or if they no longer can get that food source or they're pushed out of there or the water's out of that region they can then go back to eating bugs or and uh, omnivoric food for the most part. And we think, according to this paper, that that is why they have been able to survive. So now back to America, back to a fish in America that confirms more of this kind of stuff. So this year, there was a paper published, and it was on the Wind River Trout. And the Wind River Trout in Wyoming are a group of trout that evolved from the Yellowstone cutthroat trout. Now, Yellowstone cutthroat trout were originally native to the Yellowstone Lake, and that's as far as salmonids and trout made it into that region, up in the Rocky Mountains, over the Rocky Mountains. That's as far as they made it there. Now, a lot of the lakes in the area had no fish whatsoever, no whitefish, no northern pike minnows, no shiners, no daces, nothing like that, not even sculpins. And yet, 
humans came along in the 1890s, 1900s, 1910s, and they took the Yellowstone trout as well as the golden trout from California, and they re rehoused them into the lakes that had no fish in them, hoping that these fish would somehow survive on insects and bugs and maybe uh, who knows what, because they're way up in the hills and mountains. I mean, we're talking about an elevation of 6,000 to 10,000 feet, some of these places, and yet these fish are surviving. And the question was, how did they survive? What changed about them? And how quickly did it happen? So knowing what we know about sticklebacks and how fit fast fish can change, scientists knew that there could be some quick changes. Well, what they found in these trout is pharyngeal flaps. And pharyngeal just means your throat or uh, kind of back jaw area. And they found that these pharyngeal flaps basically come together like this and they make like a sieve so that phytoplankton and algae can be eaten by the fish. So trout, which normally only do that if it's on a rock and they can get a big old chunk of it and, you know, they're really hungry or something, they're normally going to eat small fish, they're going to eat plants uh, very rarely, and then they're going to eat insects and little micro crustaceans. But in these lakes, they have become algivores or phytoplanktonvores, whatever you want to call them, planktivores. Uh, and it's because of these flaps in their throat, which is very similar to the starting stages that we would see of how maybe some of these species speciated in Lake Victoria. And that is that they have a second set of either jaws with full on teeth and everything, or it could just be the way their throat is. It could be a mesh in there, a way to filter things out, push out the water through the gills, and then their throat catches all the little things. Well, in those lakes in a hundred years, also the plankton and the algae, all the little micro uh, flora and fauna have also shrunken. And that's because they're trying to not get caught in the throats of the fish. They're trying to out small them and get pushed back out into the water. So it's a really amazing thing to see this kind of battle between these species. And it's going on within lifetimes of people. So if that can go on within 100 years, 120 years, we know within 50 years, a fish can totally change its patterns. It can change how its spikes and what it looks like finnage wise and its armor. This can definitely change in a lake with multiple fish. And it turns out that Lake Victoria had fish that entered and then they may have speciated because it's such a large lake like Lake Nicaragua or Guatemala to different areas and they took over those areas. Well then, before they had drifted too far, the paper has come to say, you know what, these fish actually intermingled. So they crossed and hybridized. And remember those latent traits I was talking about, like the ability to grow 30 spines or whatever? It may have been that it took 2,000 years, who knows? 200 years. We really don't know how long. We're still learning this. But maybe they grew all those spikes back and another group of fish didn't. And those fish with the spikes got smaller and smaller and started eating plankton and getting pharyngeal gills and, and different straining methods to eat small food. And the other ones started getting teeth to be able to eat those fish that are now armored and spiky. That's an example that doesn't really line up perfectly with Lake Victoria, but I, I was trying to show you the examples from North America and how that could happen. Yet in Lake Victoria, we have over 18 different groups of fish when you look at whether they're nest brooders, whether they're uh, egg scatterers, or whether they protect their nest, whether they the, the males and females look the same or different. And it turns out that the genes that control color, there's very few of them, which was very surprising to scientists. And it turns out that many, many, many of the cichlids in that lake can hybridize. And that's why people are very particular about keeping Rift Lake and Victorian cichlids separate from one another when they're a certain collection point. Because a hundred miles away in the lake, you may have a bright orange version of a fish that's a little smaller, or has a different fin, and yet you may have a bright purple version another uh, hundred miles in the other direction. And it's just 
evolve within its group, yet you put them together and they can still cross. So some number of them are still going to cross. And they think that that was going on before the 20,000 to 16,000, the 4,000 year gap where there's no water for the fish to even exist in. They think that's what was going on over and over in this lake. And all that was able to survive for who knows how long, could be several million years, was the three common ancestors and really most of them are from two common ancestors and they've charted this all out fabulously in the paper and i highly recommend you guys check it out you can either email an author and you know beg for them to have mercy on you to be able to check out this massive paper if you're really into the genetics and stuff or you can breeze through the abstract you can download all the image files and you can download all the genealogy charts for free i'll put the link in the description below and links to other related articles today. But it is through this fission and fusion and changing over a long period that these fish got all these different traits and they may have evolved traits that were dead ends and then maybe evolved back into a generalist. Well, they had those epigenetics and genetics to say, yeah, but I have this secret trait hidden. And so when that gene need was needed in the future, it was reignited and it came back and then is able to express in a very short amount of time. And we're also seeing already, just since humans have introduced the Nile tilapia into the river system and the uh, Victoria lake system, we're able to see in all the different lakes that humans have put them in for a food source, how the cichlids that, ex that live there have adapted. And now we're th seeing possible signs of new speciation, definitely new subspecies, but new speciation, new behavior, new traits, because of how much those exist. It used to be that 90 to 70 percent is the estimate, I know that's kind of a window, of the fish in Lake Victoria were cichlids that preyed on other cichlids that were fish eaters. Now they think that number is only 10% of endemic and native fish to Lake Victoria. The rest are all invasive and they're eating up all the baby cichlids. They're eating up the adult cichlids even. Uh, it's a bad situation. We do a whole other video on that. But it's this situation that has allowed fish to then hide in places like Lake Edwards potentially, evolve on their own in there, and then come back and hybridize that ability to hybridize never being too far away but being in a giant lake but not too giant it's not an ocean and them recrossing keeps those genes mixing around and it keeps those older traits alive and it keeps the ability of very very weird things to pop up because it was in the lineage of these fish that had been expanded and out in swamps and out in deep water and out in big water and then all of a sudden the water retracted and all those fish got put together and maybe most of them died but they held the genes of so many of the hybrids that came before them in a lineage and so when the lake was ready to refill with water and from the river flow from the north into the lake, then they were able to re-enter the lake and turn into the 500 plus species that are in Victoria. Probably the same is true with Lake Tanganyika, but we have 446 species with their genetics sorted and even how they're related and if they can hybridize with one another all mapped out in this wonderful paper and it really changes the way we need to think about things so thank you so much for watching i hope you found it amazing fascinating nature is just full of endless wonder and if you like these kind of videos these deep dives these uh looking at new scientific papers discussing them things like that please hit that like button subscribe if you're not and you feel like i have earned it and if you're really really feeling foxy and you want to help me continue my work uh you know you can become a channel member for as little as a dollar 99 get access to an extra 200 episodes of fishery which is news and science related Related to the aquarium fish and the whole world at large linked to aquarium fish 
And uh, thank you so much for making it to the end. You guys are rock stars. You guys are some of the few survivors. And you guys are the ones who are going to make it. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a great day. I'll see you guys next time on Fishery.